The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant. Copyright 1944 by Will Durant. Copyright renewed 1972 by Will Durant. This recording of the full-length reading of Caesar and Christ was published by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mahel, trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mahel, and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1994 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant. This book consists of 30 chapters and is 672 pages long. The following material appears on the dust jacket of the book. In this massive book, whose scope and wit recall the golden days of historical writing, Will Durant recounts the flaming pageant of the rise of Rome from a crossroads town to mastery of the world. He tells of its achievements from the Crimea to Gibraltar and from the Euphrates to Hadrian's Wall, of its spread of classic civilization over the Mediterranean and Western European world. He relates Rome's struggle to preserve its ordered realm from a surrounding sea of barbarism and its long, slow crumbling and final catastrophic collapse into darkness and chaos. Primarily a cultural history, Caesar and Christ cogently discusses government, industry, manners and morals, the status of women, law, philosophy, science, literature, religion and art. Besides the varied pageant of the Catos, the Scipios, and the Gracchi, of Hannibal, Marius, Sulla, Catiline, Pompey, Antony, Cleopatra, and the emperors, good, bad, and indifferent, we view Cicero, busy in all departments of life, Lucretius, Catullus, Virgil, Horace, Ovid, Tacitus, Juvenal, and such cultivators of latter-day Hellenism as Plutarch, Lucian, and Marcus Aurelius. We watch the rise of temples, basilicas, and forums, pass a day of games and spectacles at the Flavian Amphitheater, correctly nicknamed the Colosseum. Turning to the eastern Mediterranean, we accompany Christ on his ministry, witness the tragic scenes of the Passion, and sail and walk with Paul on his missionary labors. The colors darken, Palmyra rises and falls, the empire attains a new and spurious invincibility under the emperor Aurelian, declines, and finally stiffens into a bureaucratic mold. Caesar and Christ contains many parallels to modern history, and Dr. Durant presents them with lucid authority. He believes that a reading of past events should illuminate the present. In the class struggles and jockeying for power that typify Roman history from the Gracchi to Caesar, he finds an analogue to the development of Europe and America from the French Revolution to the present. He reminds us that dictators have ever used the same methods. He tells us that the dole was resorted to more than a century before Christ and that the first Roman labor union was established about 600 B.C. We hear of bank failures, pork barrels, depressions, governmental projects and regulations, state socialism, wartime priority plans, electoral corruption, pressure groups, trade associations and other phenomena of ancient Rome that might easily fit into front-page headlines today. Caesar and Christ, Volume 3 of Will Durant's Monumental Survey of World History, represents the result of 25 years' preparation and five years' writing. Like the earlier volumes, Caesar and Christ is an independent, self-contained segment of the story of civilization, the Durant's celebrated 11-volume cultural history. Dedication to Ariel Preface. This volume, while an independent unit by itself, is part three in a history of civilization, of which part one was our oriental heritage, and part two was the life of Greece. War and health permitting, part four, the age of faith, should be ready in 1950. The method of these volumes is synthetic history, which studies all the major phases of a people's life, work, and culture in their simultaneous operation. Analytic history, which is equally necessary and a scholarly prerequisite, studies some separate phase of man's activity, politics, economics, morals, religion, science, philosophy, literature, art, in one civilization or in all. 
The defect of the analytic method is the distorting isolation of a part from the whole. The weakness of the synthetic method lies in the impossibility of one mind speaking with first-hand knowledge on every aspect of a complex civilization spanning a thousand years. Errors of detail are inevitable, but only in this way can a mind enchanted by philosophy, the quest for understanding through perspective, content itself with delving into the past. We may seek perspective through science by studying the relations of things in space, or through history by studying the relations of events in time. We shall learn more of the nature of man by watching his behavior through sixty centuries than by reading Plato and Aristotle, Spinoza and Kant. All philosophy, said Nietzsche, has now fallen forfeit to history. The study of antiquity is properly accounted worthless except as it may be made living drama or illuminate our contemporary life. The rise of Rome from a crossroads town to world mastery, its achievement of two centuries of security and peace from the Crimea to Gibraltar, and from the Euphrates to Hadrian's Wall, its spread of classic civilization over the Mediterranean and Western European world, its struggle to preserve its ordered realm from a surrounding sea of barbarism, its long, slow, crumbling, and final catastrophic collapse into darkness and chaos. This is surely the greatest drama ever played by man, unless it be that other drama which began when Caesar and Christ stood face to face in Pilate's court, and continued until a handful of hunted Christians had grown by time and patience and through persecution and terror, to be first the allies, then the masters, and at last the heirs of the greatest empire in history. But that multiple panorama has greater meaning for us than through its scope and majesty. It resembles significantly, and sometimes with menacing illumination, the civilization and problems of our day, this is the advantage of studying a civilization in its total scope and life, that one may compare each stage or aspect of its career with the corresponding moment or element of our own cultural trajectory, and be warned or encouraged by the ancient aftermath of a modern phase. There, in the struggle of Roman civilization against barbarism within and without, is our own struggle. Through Rome's problems of biological and moral decadence, signposts rise on our road today the class war of the Gracchi against the Senate, of Marius against Sulla, of Caesar against Pompey, of Antony against Octavian, is the war that consumes our interludes of peace. And the desperate effort of the Mediterranean soul to maintain some freedom against a despotic state is an augury of our coming task. De nobis fabula narratur. Of ourselves this Roman story is told. I wish to acknowledge the invaluable and self-sacrificing aid of Wallace Brockway at every step in the preparation of this book, the patience of my daughter, Mrs. David Easton, and of Miss Regina Sands in typing twelve hundred pages from my minuscule script, and above all to the affectionate toleration and protective guidance accorded me by my wife through many years of dull and plodding and happy scholarship. Introduction Origins Chapter 1. Etruscan Prelude, 800 to 508 B.C. 1. Italy. Quiet hamlets in the mountain valleys, spacious pastures on the slopes, lakes upheld in the chalice of the hills, fields green or yellow verging toward blue seas, villages and towns drowsy under the noon sun and then alive with passion, cities in which amid dust and dirt everything from cottage to cathedral seems beautiful. This, for two thousand years, has been Italy. Throughout the whole earth and wherever the vault of heaven spreads, there is no country so fair. Thus even the prosaic elder Pliny spoke of his fatherland. Here is eternal spring, sang Virgil, and summer even in months not her own. Twice in the year the cattle breed, twice the trees serve us with fruit. Twice a year the roses bloomed at Pestum, and in the north lay many a fertile plain like Mantua's feeding the white swans with grassy stream. Like a spine along the great peninsula ran the Apennines, shielding the west coast from the northeast winds and blessing the soil with rivers that hurried to lose themselves in captivating bays. On the north the Alps stood guard. On every other side protecting waters lapped difficult and often precipitous shores. It was a land well suited to reward an industrious population, and strategically placed athwart the Mediterranean to rule the classic world. The mountains brought death as well as splendor, 
for earthquakes and eruptions now and then embalmed the labor of centuries in ashes. But here, as usually, death was a gift to life. The lava mingled with organic matter to enrich the earth for a hundred generations. Part of the terrain was too steep for cultivation, and part of it was malarial marsh. The rest was so fertile that Polybius marveled at the abundance and cheapness of food in ancient Italy, and suggested that the quantity and quality of its crops might be judged from the vigor and courage of its men. Alfieri thought that the man plant had flourished better in Italy than anywhere else. Even today, the timid student is a bit frightened by the intense feelings of these fascinating folk. Their taut muscles, swift love and anger, smoldering or blazing eyes, the pride and fury that made Italy great and tore her to pieces in the days of Marius and Caesar and the Renaissance still run in Italian blood, only awaiting a good cause or argument. Nearly all the men are virile and handsome, nearly all the women beautiful, strong, and brave. What land can match the dynasty of genius that the mothers of Italy have poured forth through thirty centuries? No other country has been so long the hub of history, at first in government, then in religion, then in art. For seventeen hundred years, from Cato censor to Michelangelo, Rome was the center of the Western world. Those who are the best judges in that country, says Aristotle, report that when Italus became king of Enotria, the people changed their name and called themselves no longer Enotrians, but Italians. Enotria was the toe of the Italian boot, so teeming with grapes that the word meant land of wine. Italus, says Thucydides, was a king of the Sicils, who had occupied Enotria on the way to conquer and name Sicily. Just as the Romans called all Hellenes, Graeci, Greeks, from a few Graei who had emigrated from North Attica to Naples, so the Greeks gradually extended the name Italia to all the peninsula south of the Po. Doubtless many chapters of Italy's story lie silent under her crowded soil. Remains of an old Stone Age culture indicate that for at least 30,000 years before Christ, the plains were inhabited by man. Between 10,000 and 6,000 B.C., a Neolithic culture appeared, a long-headed race called by ancient tradition Liguri and Sicilii fashioned rude pottery with linear ornament, made tools and weapons of polished stone, domesticated animals, hunted and fished and buried their dead. Some lived in caves, others in round huts of wattle and daub. From these cylindrical cottages, architecture pursued a continuous development to the round House of Romulus on the Palatine, the Temple of Vesta in the Forum, and the Mausoleum of Hadrian, the Castel Sant'Angelo of today. About 2000 BC, northern Italy was invaded, presumably not for the first time, by tribes from Central Europe. They brought with them the custom of building their villages upon piles sunk in water for safety from animal or human attack. They settled on Garda, Como, Maggiore, and the other enchanted lakes that still lure aliens to Italy. Later they moved south, and, finding fewer lakes, built their homes upon land, but still upon a foundation of piles. Their habit of surrounding these settlements with rampart and moat passed down to form features of Roman camps and medieval chateaus. They pastured flocks and herds, tilled the soil, wove clothing, fired pottery. And out of bronze, which had appeared in Italy toward the end of the Neolithic Age, about 2500 B.C., they forged a hundred varieties of tools and weapons, including combs, hairpins, razors, tweezers, and other timeless implements. They allowed their rubbish to accumulate so lavishly around the villages that their culture has received the name of terra mare, earth marl, from the fertilizing potency of these remains. So far as we know, they were the direct ancestors of the basic population of Italy in historical times. In the valley of the Po, the descendants of these Taramaricoli, about 1000 B.C., learned from Germany the use of iron, made from it improved implements, and so armed, spread their Villanovan culture from its center at Villanova, near Bologna, far down into Italy. From them, we may believe, came the blood, languages, and essential arts of the Umbrians, Sabines, and Latins. Then, about 800 B.C., a new flood of immigrants arrived, subjugated the Villanovan population, and established between the Tiber and the Alps one of the strangest civilizations in the records of mankind. 2. Etruscan Life 
The Etruscans are among the irritating obscurities of history. They ruled Rome for a hundred years or more, and left upon Roman ways so varied an influence that Rome can hardly be understood without them. Yet Roman literature is as mute concerning them as a matron anxious to forget publicly the surrenders of her youth. Italian civilization, as literate provision, begins with them. Eight thousand inscriptions, as well as many works of art, mingle with their remains, and there are indications of a lost literature in poetry, drama, and history. But only a few unrevealing words of the language have been deciphered, and scholarship stands in deeper darkness today before the Etruscan mystery than that which shrouded the Egypt of the pharaohs before Champollion. Consequently, men still debate who the Etruscans were, and when and whence they came. Perhaps the old tradition has been too readily set aside. Pedants love to disprove the accepted, which mischievously survives. Most Greek and Roman historians took it for granted that the Etruscans had come from Asia Minor. Many elements in their religion, dress, and art suggest an Asiatic origin. Many, again, seem natively Italian. Most likely the civilization of Etruria was an outgrowth of the Villanovan culture, commercially influenced by Greece and the Near East, while the Etruscans themselves, as they believed, were invaders from Asia Minor, probably Lydia. In any case, their superior killing power made them the ruling caste in Tuscany. We do not know where they landed, but we know that they founded, conquered, or developed many cities, not mere villages of mud and straw as before them, but walled towns with geometrically laid out streets, and houses not only of beaten earth, but often of baked brick or stone. Twelve of these communities joined in a loose Etruscan federation, dominated by Tarquinii, now Corneto, Aricium, or Arezzo, Perugia, or Perugia, and Vei, or Isola Farnese. The names given are Roman, the Etruscan names are unknown. Hardships of transportation through mountains and forests collaborated with the jealous pugnacity of men, here as in Greece, to form independent city-states, seldom united against external foes. Each cherished its separate security, often stood aside while others were attacked, and one after another succumbed to Rome. But through most of the 6th century B.C., these allied municipalities constituted the strongest political force in Italy, with a well-organized army, a famous cavalry, and a powerful navy that for a time ruled what is still called the Tyrrhene, that is, Etruscan Sea. As in the case of Rome, the government of the Etruscan cities began as a monarchy, became an oligarchy of first families, and gradually gave over to an assembly of propertied citizens the right of choosing the annual magistrates. So far as we can make out from the tomb paintings and reliefs, it was a thoroughly feudal society, with an aristocracy owning the soil and enjoying in luxury the surplus product of Villanovan serfs and war-won slaves. Under this discipline, Tuscany was reclaimed from forest and swamp, and a system of rural irrigation and urban sewage was developed beyond anything discoverable in contemporary Greece. Etruscan engineers built drainage tunnels to take the overflow of lakes and cut drained roadways through rock and hill. As early as 700 B.C., Etruscan industry mined the copper of the western coast and the iron of Elba, smelted the iron ore at Populonia, and sold pig iron throughout Italy. Etruscan merchants traded up and down the Tyrrhene Sea, brought amber, tin, lead, and iron from northern Europe down the Rhine and the Rhone and over the Alps, and sold Etruscan products in every major port of the Mediterranean. About 500 B.C., Etruscan towns issued their own coins. The people themselves are pictured on their tombs as short and stocky, with large heads, features almost Anatolian, complexion ruddy, especially in women, but rouge is as old as civilization. The ladies were famous for their beauty, and the men sometimes had faces of refinement and nobility. Civilization had already advanced to a precarious height, for specimens of dental bridge work have been found in the graves. Dentistry, like medicine and surgery, had been imported from Egypt and Greece. Both sexes wore the hair long, and the men fondled beards. Garments followed the Ionian style, an inner shirt like the chiton, and an outer robe that became the Roman toga. Men as well as women loved ornament, and their tombs abounded in jewelry. If we may judge from the gay pictures of the sepulchres, the life of the Etruscans, like that of the Cretans, was hardened with combat, softened with luxury, and brightened with feasts and games. The men waged war lustily and practiced a variety of virile sports. They hunted, 
fought bulls in the arena, and drove their chariots, sometimes four horses abreast, around a dangerous course. They threw the discus and the javelin, pole vaulted, raced, wrestled, boxed, and fought in gladiatorial bouts. Cruelty marked these games, for the Etruscans, like the Romans, thought it dangerous to let civilization get too far from the brute. Less heroic persons brandished dumbbells, threw dice, played the flute, or danced. Scenes of bibulous merriment relieve the paintings in the tombs. Sometimes they are symposia for men only, with vinous conversation. Now and then, they show both sexes, richly dressed, reclining in pairs on elegant couches, eating and drinking, waited on by slaves, and entertained by dancers and musicians. Occasionally the meal is adorned with an amorous embrace. Probably the lady in this case was a courtesan, corresponding to the Greek Hatyra. If we may believe the Romans, the young women of Etruria, like those of Greek Asia and Samurai Japan, were allowed to obtain dowries by prostitution. A character in Plautus accuses a girl of seeking in the Tuscan way to earn her marriage by the shame of her body. Nevertheless, women enjoyed a high status in Etruria, and the paintings represent them as prominent in every aspect of life. Relationship was traced through the mother in a manner suggesting again an Asiatic origin. Education was not confined to the male, for Tanaquil, wife of the first Tarquin, was versed in mathematics and medicine as well as political intrigue. Theopompus ascribed a communism of women to the Etruscan, but no confirming evidence has come down to us of this platonic utopia. Many of the pictures are scenes of marital concord and family life, with children romping about in happy ignorance. Religion provided every incentive to negative morality. The Etruscan pantheon was fully equipped to terrify the growing ego and ease the tasks of parentage. The greatest of the gods was Tinea, who wielded the thunder and lightning. About him, as a committee pitilessly carrying out his commands, were the twelve great gods, so great that it was sacrilege, and we may therefore neglect to pronounce their names. Especially fearsome were Mantis and Mania, master and mistress of the underworld, each with an executive horde of winged demons. Least appeasable of all was Lesa or Mian, goddess of fate, brandishing snakes or a sword, and armed with stylus and ink to write and hammer and nails to affix her unalterable decrees. Pleasanter were the Lares and Penates, little statuettes kept on the hearth and symbolizing the spirits of field and home. The sacred science of ascertaining the future by studying the livers of sheep or the flight of birds had probably come down to the Etruscans from Babylonia. But according to their own traditions, it had been revealed to them by a divine boy, grandson of Tinea, who sprang to life from a furrow freshly turned and at once spoke with the wisdom of a sage. The Etruscan ritual culminated in the sacrifice of a sheep, a bull, or a man. Human victims were slaughtered or buried alive at the funerals of the great. In some cases, prisoners of war were massacred as a propitiation of the gods. So the Phocians taken at Alalia in 535 B.C. were stoned to death in the Forum of Siri, and some 300 Romans captured in 358 B.C. were sacrificed at Tarquinii. The Etruscan appears to have believed that for every enemy slain he could secure the release of a soul from hell. The belief in hell was the favorite feature of Etruscan theology. The dead spirit, as seen in the sepulchral representations, was conducted by genii to the tribunal of the underworld, where in a last judgment it was given an opportunity to defend its conduct in life. If it failed, it was condemned to a variety of torments that left their mark on Virgil, reared on Mantua's Etruscan lore, on the early Christian conception of hell, and through these and twenty centuries, on Tuscan Dante's Inferno. From such damnation the good were spared, and the sufferings of the damned might be shortened by the prayers or sacrifices of their living friends. The saved soul passed from the underworld to the society of the gods above, there to enjoy feasts, luxuries, and powers depicted hopefully on the tombs. Normally the Etruscans buried their dead. Those who could afford it were laid to rest in sarcophagi of terracotta or stone, and the lid was topped with reclining figures, carved partly in their likeness, partly in the smiling style of the archaic Greek Apollos. Here again, Etruscan traditions contributed to medieval art. Occasionally, the dead were cremated and placed in cinerary urns, which also might be adorned with the figure of the deceased. In many cases, the urn or tomb simulated a house. Sometimes the tomb, cut into the rock, was divided into rooms and was equipped for post-mortem living with furniture, utensils, vases, clothing, weapons, mirrors, cosmetics, and gems. 
In a tomb at Siri, the skeleton of a warrior lay on a perfectly preserved bed of bronze, with weapons and chariots beside it, and in a chamber behind his were the ornaments and jewelry of a woman, presumably his wife. The dust that had been her beloved body was clothed in her bridal robes. 3. Etruscan Art Etruscan art is nearly all that we know of Etruscan history. We can trace in it the manners and morals of the people, the power of religion and caste, and the changing tides of economic and cultural contact with Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. It was an art fettered by ecclesiastical conventions and liberated by technical skill. It reflected a brutal and obscurantist civilization, but expressed it with character and force. Oriental influences, Ionic, Cypriot, Egyptian, dictated its earlier forms and styles, and Greek models dominated its later sculpture and pottery. In architecture and painting, however, in bronze, statuary, and the working of metals, Etruscan art spoke with its own voice and was unique. The architectural remains are never more than fragments or tombs. Parts of Etruria's city walls still stand, heavy structures of uncemented masonry firmly and accurately joined. The homes of rich Etruscans defined the classic design of the Italian house, a deliberately forbidding external wall, a central atrium or reception room, an opening in the roof of the atrium to let rain fall into a cistern below, and a circuit of small chambers surrounding the atrium and often faced by a colonnaded porch. Vitruvius has described Etruscan temples, and the tombs sometimes take their form. Essentially, they followed Greek models, but the Tuscan style modified the Doric by leaving the column unfluted, giving it a base and planning the cella on a six-to-five proportion of length to breadth, instead of the more graceful attic relation of six to three. A cella of brick, a peristyle of stone, architraves and pediments of wood, reliefs and ornaments in terracotta, the whole resting on a podium or elevation, and brightly painted outside and within. This was the Etruscan temple. For secular mass architecture, for city gates and walls, aqueducts and drains, the Etruscans, so far as we know, introduced the arch and vault to Italy. Apparently they had brought these majestic forms from Lydia, which had taken them from Babylonia. But they did not follow up this brilliant method of covering great spaces without a confusion of columns and an oppressive weight of architraves. For the most part they walked in the grooves worn by the Greeks and left Rome to consummate the Arcuate Revolution. The most renowned of Etruria's products is its pottery. Every museum abounds in it, setting the weary navigator of ceramic halls to wonder what unseen perfection exonerates these stores. Etruscan vases, when they are not clearly copies of Greek forms, are mediocre in design, crude in execution, barbarous in ornament. No other art has produced so many distortions of the human frame, so many hideous masks, uncouth animals, monstrous demons and terrifying gods. But the black wares, Bucero Nero, of the 6th century B.C. have an Italian vigor and perhaps represent an indigenous development of Villanovan styles. Fine vases were found at Vulci and at Tarquinii, imported from Athens or imitated from black-figured attic shapes. The Francois vase, a huge amphora discovered at Chiusi by a Frenchman of that name, was apparently the work of the Greek masters Clitius and Ergotimus. The later urns, red-figured on a black ground, are elegant, but again evidently of Greek manufacture. Their abundance suggests that the Attic potters had captured the Etruscan market and driven the native workers into merely industrial production. All in all, the robbers were justified who, when they rifled Etruscan tombs, left so much of the pottery. We cannot speak of Etruscan bronzes with such reckless irreverence. The bronze casters of Etruria were at the top of their craft. They almost rivaled the potters in productivity. One city alone is reported to have had 2,000 statues in bronze. What remains to us from their hands belongs mostly to the period of Roman domination. Among these reliefs, two masterpieces stand out. The orator, who now holds forth with Roman dignity and bronze restraint in the Archaeological Museum at Florence, and also at Florence, the Chimera, found at Arezzo in 1553, and partly restored by Cellini. It is a disagreeable figure, presumably the monster slain by Bellerophon, head and body of a lion, a serpent for a tail, a goat's head growing anomalously out of the back. But its power and finish reconcile us to its biological extravagance. Etruscan bronze workers produced, often for distant export, millions of statuettes, swords, helmets, cuirasses, 
spears, shields, utensils, urns, coins, locks, chains, fans, mirrors, beds, lamps, candelabra, even chariots. Greeting the visitor to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York is an Etruscan chariot. Body and wheels of wood, sheathing and tires of bronze, the high front embossed with figures of considerable grace. Many bronze objects were delicately engraved. The surface was coated with wax, the design was etched in with a stylus, the piece was dipped into acid, the wax-freed lines were burned into the metal, and then the wax was melted away. In the working of silver and gold, bone and ivory, the Etruscan artist was the heir and peer of the Egyptian and the Greek. Sculpture in stone was never popular in Etruria. Marble was scarce, and the quarries of Carrara were apparently unknown. Fine clays were at hand, however, and soon took shape in a profusion of terracotta reliefs, statuettes, and sepulchral or architectural ornaments. About the end of the 6th century, an unknown Etruscan artist established a school of sculpture at Veii and molded the chef d'oeuvre of Etruscan art. That Apollo of Veii, which was found on the site in 1916 and until lately stood in the Villa Giulia at Rome. Modeled on the Ionian and Attic Apollos of the time, this engaging statue shows an almost feminine Mona Lisa face, with delicate smile, archly slanting eyes, and a body of health, beauty, and life. The Italians call it Il Apollo che Camina, the Apollo that walks. In this, and in many excellent figures on sarcophagi, Etruscan sculptors carried to perfection the Asiatic stylization of hair and drapery, while in the orator they, or their Roman heirs, established a tradition of realistic portraiture. Etruscan painting collaborated with that of Greek Italy in transmitting another art to Rome. The elder Pliny described frescoes at Ardea of older age than Rome itself, and at Syria others of still greater antiquity and supreme beauty. The art used pottery and the interiors of homes and tombs for its surfaces— only tomb frescoes and vase pictures remain, but in such quantity that every stage of Etruscan painting can be traced in them, from Oriental and Egyptian, through Greek and Alexandrian, to Roman and Pompeian styles. In some tombs we find the first examples of windows, portals, columns, porticos, and other architectural forms mimicked by painting on inner walls, in the very manner of Pompeii. Often the colors of these frescoes are faded. A few are astonishingly fresh and brilliant after more than a score of centuries. The technique is mediocre. In the earlier pictures there is no perspective, no foreshortening, no use of light and shade to give fullness and depth. The figures are Egyptianly slender, as if seen in a horizontal convex mirror. The faces are regularly in profile, wherever the feet may point. In the later examples, perspective and foreshortening appear, and the proportions of the body are represented with greater fidelity and skill. But in either case there is in these paintings a frolicsome and impish vivacity, it makes one wonder how pleasant the life of the Etruscans must have been if their tombs were so gay. Here are men in battle and enjoying it, or they play at war in the jousts of the arena. They hunt the boar or lion with all the bravery of men who have or expect an audience. They box or wrestle in the palestra, while the spectators dispute more violently than the combatants. They ride their horses or drive their chariots around the amphitheater. Sometimes, resigned to peace, they fish. One pleasant scene shows a couple idly boating on a quiet stream. So old is wisdom. In a grave at Siri, the pictured man and his lady recline on a couch. Garlanded with laurel, he pledges her his eternal fidelity with a goblet of wine. She smiles and believes him, though she knows he lies. In other burial chambers, the Etruscan painter sketches his idea of paradise. Endless revelry, with careless lasses dancing wildly to double pipes and the lyre. Pipes and lyres, trumpets and syrinxes, were apparently essential to every banquet, wedding, and funeral. Love of music and the dance is one of the gracious aspects of Etruscan civilization. In the tomb of the lioness at Cornetto, the figures whirl about in nude and bacchic frenzy. It was the natural destiny of the Etruscans to expand north and south, to extend their sway to the foothills of the Alps and the Greek cities of Campania, and then to find themselves face to face across the Tiber with growing Rome. They established colonies at Verona, Padua, Mantua, Parma, Modena, Bologna, and beyond the Apennines at Rimini, Ravenna, and Adria. From this modest Etruscan outpost, the Adriatic took its name. They hemmed in Rome with Etruscan settlements at Fidini, Prinesti, or Palestrina, and Capua, perhaps also at Cicero's Tusculum, Little Tuscany. Finally, in 618 BC, according to a precise and precarious tradition, 
an Etruscan adventurer captured the throne of Rome, and for a century the Roman nation was ruled and formed by Etruscan civilization and power. 4. Rome under the Kings About 1000 BC, Villanovan migrants crossed the Tiber and settled in Latium. No one knows whether they conquered or exterminated or merely married the Neolithic population they found there. Slowly, the agricultural villages of this historic region between the Tiber and the Bay of Naples coalesced into a few jealously sovereign city-states, loath to unite except in annual religious festivals or occasional wars. The strongest was Alba Longa, lying at the foot of Mount Alban, probably where Castel Gandolfo now shelters the Pope on summer days. It was from Alba Longa, perhaps in the 8th century before Christ, that a colony of Latins, greedy for conquest or driven by the pressure of the birth rate upon the land, moved some twenty miles to the northwest and founded the most famous of man's habitations. This hazardously hypothetical paragraph contains all that history dares say about the origin of Rome. But Roman tradition was not so parsimonious. When the Gauls burned the city in 390 BC, most historical records were presumably destroyed, and thereafter patriotic fancy could paint a free picture of Rome's birth. What we should call April 22nd, 753 BC, was given as the date, and the events were reckoned A.U.C., Anno Urbis Conditae, in the year from the city's foundation. A hundred tales and a thousand poems told how Aeneas, offspring of Aphrodite Venus, had fled from burning Troy, and how, after suffering many lands and men, had brought to Italy the gods or sacred effigies of Priam's city. Aeneas had married Lavinia, daughter of the king of Latium, and eight generations later their descendant, Numitor, said the story, held the throne of Alba Longa, Latium's capital. A usurper, Amulius, expelled Numitor and to the end of the line of Aeneas, killed Numitor's sons and forced his only daughter, Rhea Silvia, to become a priestess of Vesta, vowed to virginity. But Rhea lay down by the banks of a stream and opened her bosom to catch the breeze. Too trustful of gods and men, she fell asleep. Mars, overcome with her beauty, left her rich with twins. Amulius ordered these to be drowned. They were placed on a raft, which kind waves carried to the land. They were suckled by a she-wolf, or lupa, or, said a skeptical variant, by a shepherd's wife, Acca Laurentia, nicknamed lupa because, like a wolf's, her lovemaking knew no law. When Romulus and Remus grew up, they killed Amulius, restored Numitor, and went resolutely forth to build a kingdom for themselves on the hills of Rome. Archaeology offers no confirmation to these stories of our youth. Probably they contain a core of truth. Perhaps the Latins sent a colony to develop Rome as a strategic moat against the expanding Etruscans. The site was twenty miles from the sea, and not well adapted to maritime commerce. But in those days of marauding pirates, it was an advantage to be a bit inland. For internal trade, Rome was well placed at the crossroads of traffic on the river and the land route between north and south. It was not a healthy location. Rains, floods, and springs fed malarial marshes in the surrounding plain and even in the lower levels of the city, hence the popularity of the Seven Hills. The first of these to be settled, tradition said, was the Palatine, possibly because an island near its foot made easier there the fording and bridging of the Tiber. One by one the neighboring slopes were peopled until the human overflow crossed the river and built upon the Vatican and Janiculum. The three tribes, Latins, Sabines, and Etruscans, that dwelt on the hills, joined in a federation, the Septimantium, and slowly merged into the city of Rome. The ancient story goes on to tell how Romulus, to secure wives for his settlers, arranged some public games and invited the Sabines and other tribes to attend. During the races, the Romans seized the Sabine women and drove off the Sabine men. Titus Tatius, king of the Sabine Curites tribe, declared war and advanced upon Rome. Tarpeia, daughter of the Roman who had charge of a fortress on the Capitoline, opened a gate to the invaders. They crushed her with their shields in fair recompense, and later generations gave her name to that Tarpeian rock from which condemned men were hurled to death. As the troops of Tatius neared the Palatine, the Sabine women, not insensitive to the compliment of capture, secured an armistice on the plea that they would lose their husbands if the Curites won, and their brothers or fathers if the Curites lost. Romulus persuaded Tatius to share the kingdom with him and join his tribe with the Latins in a common citizenship. Thereafter, the freemen of Rome were called Curites or Quirites. There may again be some elements of truth in this wholesale romance, or perhaps it patriotically concealed a Sabine conquest of Rome. 
After a long reign, Romulus was lifted up to heaven in a whirlwind, thereafter to be worshipped as Quirinus, one of Rome's favorite gods. Tatius, too, having died, the heads of the more important families chose a Sabine, Numa Pompilius, as king. Probably the real power of government between the foundation of the city and the Etruscan domination was in the hands of these elders, or senatores, while the functions of the king, like those of the Archon Basilius in coeval Athens, were chiefly those of the highest priest. Tradition pictured Numa as a Sabine Marcus Aurelius, at once philosopher and saint. He strove, says Livy, to inculcate fear of the gods as the most powerful influence that could act upon a barbarous people. But as this effort would fail to impress them without some claim to supernatural wisdom, he pretended that he had nocturnal interviews with the divine nymph Egeria, and that it was on her advice that he was instituting the religious ritual most acceptable to heaven, and was appointing special priests for each major deity. By establishing a uniform worship for the diverse tribes of Rome, Numa strengthened the unity and stability of the state. By interesting the bellicose Romans in religion, Cicero thought, Numa gave his people forty years of peace. His successor, Tullus Hostilius, restored to the Romans their normal life. Convinced that the vigor of the state was becoming enfeebled through inaction, he looked around for a pretext for war. He chose Rome's mother city, Alba Longa, as an enemy, attacked it, and completely destroyed it. When the Alban king broke a promise of alliance, Tullus had him tied to two chariots and torn to pieces by driving the chariots in opposite directions. His successor, Ancus Martius, agreed with his martial philosophy. Ancus understood, according to Dio Cassius, that it is not sufficient for men who wish to remain at peace to refrain from wrongdoing, but the more one longs for peace, the more vulnerable one becomes. He saw that a desire for quiet was not a power for protection unless accompanied by equipment for war. He perceived also that delight in freedom from foreign broils very quickly ruined men who were unduly enthusiastic over it. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.